witnesses to believe you should use your common sense and judgment, I suggest you consider a number of factors. Whether the witness appeared to be candid, whether the witness appeared worthy of belief, the appearance or the demeanor of the witness while testifying, whether the witness has any interest in the outcome of the case, whether the witness has any reason for not telling the truth, whether what the witness said seemed reasonable or probable, whether what the witness said seemed unreasonable or inconsistent with the other evidence in the case or with that witness's prior statements, whether the witness has any, had any friendship or animosity towards other people in the case. In deciding which witnesses to believe and how much of their testimony to believe, you should consider both the direct and the cross-examination of the witness. You should consider these factors in deciding the credibility of all witnesses, whether or not they happen to be ordinary citizens or police officers. In short, you should consider the testimony of each witness and give it the weight you think it deserves. You can accept all of what a witness has said, you can reject all of what a witness has said, or you can accept some of it and reject some of it. It's entirely up to you. As I noted earlier, you may consider whether the witness made statements before trial which were not consistent with what the witness said at trial. If the witness made an inconsistent statement made before trial, you may use that statement in deciding whether to believe that particular witness. Generally speaking, you may not use that statement made before trial as proof that the facts in the statement are true. The statement made before trial is only to be used by you in deciding whether you believe a witness. There are exceptions to this rule. Any statement made by the defendant <clears throat> before trial may be considered as proof of the facts asserted within the statement. You have heard the opinion testimony of expert witnesses. An expert is someone who has acquired some specialized knowledge, such as scientific or technical knowledge from experience, training, or education that qualifies the expert to give an opinion as to matters that are not common knowledge. The opinion of the ex expert may assist you in understanding the evidence in, or in deciding a fact and issue. You're not bound by the opinion of the expert. You're free to ignore the expert's opinion if you find that the reasons given in support of the opinion are not sound or if you find that other evidence outweighs the opinion. I'm now going to discuss the definition of the crimes with which the defendant is charged. A crime is any breaking of the law for which the law provides punishment. All crimes have at least two parts, an intent and an act. In deciding whether a person is guilty of a crime, it is absolutely necessary for you to know both what, a, what the person's actions were and what his intentions were. The word intent refers to what a person mentally believes his physical acts will accomplish, and the word act refers to a physical deed. The state has the burden of proving, beyond a reasonable doubt, the specified level of intent and a separate act for each of the crimes charged. Thus, for a person to be guilty of a crime, he must have done the following two things. He must have mentally intended to do something that is criminal, and he must have physically acted to do something that is criminal. Unless a person both intended and acted to do something criminal, that person has not committed a crime. Whether the defendant acted with the required intent is a question of fact for you to decide. Keep in mind that there is often no direct evidence of intent because there is no way of examining the operation of a person's mind. You should consider all the facts and circumstances and evidence in deciding whether or not the state has proven the defendant acted with the required intent. Remember that the reason crimes are given different names is that each refers to either a different intent or a different act, or a different intent and a different act. So for example, assume that there is two drivers of an automobile and each driver hits a person who's crossing the street. If one of the drivers purposely intended to hit the pedestrian and the other one did so out of negligence, each driver would be guilty of a different crime. As you know, in this case, Mr. Argy is charged with committing multiple crimes on or about April 4, 2019 in London Dairy, New Hampshire. <clears throat> each crime can be defined in numerous ways. The definition for each as applicable in this case is set forth below. The state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt each element of the alleged crime. Now I have, <clears throat> pardon me, now I have the crimes listed with the letter A, B, and C. And when you're asked to return your verdict, 
you will be asked in the same format as what's in my jury instructions. So the first crime that I'm going to define is falsification of physical evidence. And so when you come out and render your verdict, your, the first verdict you'll be asked to render is on that crime. Falsification of physical evidence. Number one, the defendant, believing an official investigation was about to be instituted into the death of Maureen Argy. Number two, the defendant destroyed, concealed, and or removed from 118 West Road, Londonderry, New Hampshire, Maureen Argy's cell phone. And number three, the defendant acted with a purpose to impair the cell phone's availability in such investigation. The next offense, which is B, first-degree murder. <clears throat> and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, there are, there's um, a number associated with each offense as listed in the jury instructions. Pay no regard to that number. It's, it's simply the, a charge ID that's been provided by clerk staff at some point when the charge was pending. So play, pay no attention to that. It's not relevant to your deliberation. So first-degree murder. Number one, the defendant acted purposely, and number two, the defendant caused the death of another, Maureen Argy, by strangling and or smothering her. If you decide that the defendant is guilty of the offense of first-degree murder, as just defined for you, do not consider the lesser-included crime of second-degree murder as defined below. However, if you find that the defendant is not guilty of the crime of first-degree murder as defined above, then you must go on to consider and decide whether the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that he's guilty of a similar but less serious offense of second-degree murder, the elements of which are set forth below. A similar but less serious offense is different from a more serious crime in one of two ways. In this case, it requires a less serious mental state and or a less serious act. <clears throat> and so, C, second-degree murder. Number one, the defendant acted recklessly. And number two, the defendant caused the death of another, Maureen Argy, under circumstances manifesting an extreme indifference to the value of human life by strangling and or smothering her. So certain words in these elements need further explaining. A person acts purposely when his conscious object is to cause a certain result or engage in certain conduct. The state must prove that the defendant had the conscious object to cause this result or engage in this conduct. The key words here are conscious object. To have a conscious object means to have a specific intent. It means that the defendant desired to cause a certain result or engage in certain conduct. It is not enough for the state to prove that the defendant knew or was aware of what he was doing nor is it enough for the state to prove that the defendant created a risk of injury or harm. To prove that the defendant acted purposely requires more than that. It requires proof that the defendant specifically intended or desired to bring about a particular result or to do a particular act. The state is not required to prove the manner in which or the means by which the death of Maureen Argy was caused. The state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt only that the defendant was responsible for causing the death of Maureen Argy. Purposely in the context of the charge of first degree murder means that it was the defendant's conscious object to cause Maureen Argy's death, and additionally that the defendant's actions in furtherance of causing her death were deliberate and premeditated. Premeditation and deliberation mean that the defendant thought about the killing in his mind beforehand as distinguished from an impulsive killing. To prove premeditation and deliberation, the state must show that the defendant thought about the idea of killing another human being and formed the specific intent to kill before he acted. This intent must precede the killing by some appreciable amount of time. However, no particular period of time is required. It may be a very short period of time. The human mind acts with speed that is some, sometimes impossible to measure. Given the swiftness with which the human mind can work, premeditation and deliberation do not require proof that the defendant devoted time to quiet reflection. A killing may be the result of prompt and speedy action or a hasty decision 
and still be done with premeditation and deliberation. Once a specific intent to kill is formed, the haste with which it is put into action does not affect the degree of guilt. If the killing results from a conscious choice made as a result of thought, it is sufficient to characterize the killing as deliberate and premeditated, however short the interval between the intention and the act. The basic question you should ask yourself in deciding whether the defendant acted with premeditation and deliberation is this. Did the killing result from a conscious decision made by the defendant before he acted? Usually there is no direct proof of a person's state of mind at the time he acted, so you must examine all of the facts and circumstances of the case to decide this question. You may consider the defendant's actions and conduct before the death, whether he planned or talked about the killing in advance, whether he had a motive to kill the particular individual, and whether he made any threats or statements showing that he intended the killing. You may, you may examine the defendant's actions and conduct during the homicide, whether a deadly weapon was reused, whether the manner of the killing was particularly brutal, whether multiple wounds were inflicted, whether wounds were inflicted on vital organs, whether the homicide was at a place where the defendant's acts would not be sorry, would not be detected or a time when others would not be present. Finally, you may examine the defendant's behavior after the homicide, whether he fled from the scene of the killing, whether he attempted to conceal his acts, whether he made any statements after the killing. You should consider all of these factors and all of the other evidence presented during the trial in deciding the question of premeditation and deliberation. A person acts recklessly when he is aware of and consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that his conduct will, would cause a certain result. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that, considering the circumstances known to him, its disregard constitutes a gro gross deviation from the conduct that a law-abiding person would observe in the situation. There are several components of a reckless mental state that the state must prove. They are, number one, the defendant was aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk that his conduct would cause a particular result, and number two, that the defendant consciously disregarded the risk. In other words, he elected to disregard the risk and take the chance that his conduct would cause a particular result. It is not enough for the state to prove that the defendant failed to become aware of the risk involved. The state must prove that the defendant was aware of the risk and consciously disregarded the risk. And number three, from what the defendant knew of the circumstances, his disregard of the risk was a gross deviation from what a law-abiding person would have done under the circumstances. The key words here are gross deviation. If you find the defendant's actions were unreasonable or thoughtless, that's not enough. To find that the defendant acted recklessly, you must find that his disregard of the risk was a substantial departure from what a law-abiding person would have done under the same circumstances. If the defendant created a risk but was unaware of the risk solely because he was voluntarily intoxicated, you should still find that the defendant acted recklessly. In other words, if voluntary intoxication made the defendant unaware that his conduct created a substantial and unjustifiable risk, he nonetheless acted recklessly. For a killing to be second-degree murder, the defendant must not simply act recklessly, but rather must act recklessly under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to the value of human life. This means that, I'm sorry, this means something more than merely being aware of and consciously disregarding a substantial and unjustifiable risk of death. The risk involved and the disregard must be so blatant as to manifest extreme indifference to the value of human life. You may presume the recklessness and extreme indifference required for the crime of second degree murder under, the, under this definition if you find the defendant used a deadly weapon while committing second degree murder. Members of the jury, all of the principles of law that I have given to you are intended to guide you in reaching a fair result in this case, which is important to both parties and to the court. You're to exercise your judgment and your common sense, as I said before, without passion, without prejudice, and without sympathy. 
but with honesty, understanding, and due deliberation. When you have considered and weighed all of the evidence, you must make one of the following findings with respect to the charges that are before you. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the state has proven any one or more of the elements of the offense charged, you must find the defendant not guilty. However, if you find that the state has proven all of the elements of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt, then you should find the defendant guilty. Let me remind you that a reasonable doubt is just what the words would ordinarily imply. The use of the word reasonable means simply that the doubt must be reasonable rather than unreasonable. It must be a doubt based upon reason. It is not a frivolous or fanciful doubt, nor is it one that can be easily explained away. Rather, it is such a doubt based upon reason as remains after consideration of all the evidence that the state has offered against it. As I said before, your verdict has to be unanimous. All 12 must agree on the verdict. You must consider, consider each charge separately and determine for each whether the state has proven the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. As I've already explained to you earlier, you would not necessarily reach a verdict on all three charges. If you reach a verdict of guilty on first degree murder, then you do not go on to deliberate on second degree murder. Please let the bailiff know when you've arrived at your verdict on the charges that are before you. You will then be returned to the courtroom where the foreperson will announce your verdict orally in response to a question that the clerk of court or I will ask of you. The foreperson should see to it that the jury takes up the issues that are before you and that each has a full, fair, and adequate opportunity to present his or her views, positions, and arguments with respect to the law and to the evidence. The foreperson must ensure that deliberations continue only while all 12 jurors are present. The foreperson must also monitor the jury's compliance with the judicial branch mask mandate. If the foreperson determines that a juror refuses to comply, the foreperson must immediately bring that matter to my attention. It is your duty as jurors to consult with one another and to deliberate with a view towards reaching an agreement, if you can do so without violation, to your individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but do so only after impartial consideration of all of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your views and change your opinion if you're convinced it's an erroneous one. But don't surrender your honest conviction as to the weight and to the effect of the evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or merely for the purpose of returning a verdict. If a question involving law should arise during your deliberation, the foreperson or any other member of the jury should write the question out Please include a date and time. There will be paper and pencils available to you. Um, obviously, you'll all have your notebooks as well. Please notify the bailiff that you have a question and then hand the note to the bailiff who will bring it to me for review with counsel. I will prepare a response which will be given to you either back to you in writing as you've given it to me or I'll bring you back here into the courtroom where I'll provide it to you uh, orally. If, however, your question involves one of fact, then I won't be able to help you because, as I've explained, you and you alone are the judges of the facts and you must rely on your collective memory to resolve a factual dispute. I'm going to take this moment to remind you, because this is probably the most frequently asked fact question I get, you, we have no availability of providing you a transcript of the testimony that you've already heard. You have to resolve on, uh, rely on your collective memory to resolve any factual dispute as to the testimony you've heard. No member of the jury should attempt to communicate with me by any means other than assigned writing, and I will not communicate with any member of the jury touching on the subject. I'm, I'm sorry. I will not communicate with any member of the jury on any subject touching on the merits of the case unless I do so in writing or orally here in the courtroom. Bear in mind also you're never to reveal to any person, including to me, how you stand numerically or otherwise until you've reached and announced your verdict. If I could see counsel. Um, as I've mentioned to you before, 
Um, there's 18 of you. We have to get down to 12. And so I'm going to, um, I've, I've got some pieces of paper that are rolled up with the numbers 1 through 18 individually set out in each of these pieces of paper. And I'm going to select um, by random lot uh, six numbers. Those will be the alternates. I will then move on to uh, select numbers for the four person. If you would rather not act as the four person, please don't be shy to tell me I'd rather not. I promise you we will come upon someone who will agree to act as four person. So simply tell me I'd rather not, and then I will continue to pick a number. And then that, that whoever that numbered person is will act as four person uh, during the deliberation. And then when it's time to announce your verdict, that person will, in the first instance, be asked to announce your verdict on the charges that have been placed before you. Um, and as I indicated earlier, the, the um, uh, and I'll take this moment now to uh, remind you, the six members that are in the alternate panel, uh, we are, uh, we are going to bring you into one of the regular jury deliberation rooms. We've, we've looked at it and we believe that you can be um, spatially distanced. Uh, there are windows in those uh, jury deliberation rooms. We're happy to crack a window open if any of you would like that. Uh, and you will remain in that room uh, during the jury deliberation room by the panel of 12. Uh, as you've been told before, uh, there could come a time where one or more of you would be asked to participate in the deliberation by the panel of 12. Um, there are times where people that are asked to deliberate um, have emergencies or there's some other issue that comes up that uh, warrants their excusal from jury deliberation. And that, at that point, we call upon the alternate uh, and the, the remaining 11 and ask whether or not they can restart jury deliberation with the new now impaneled jury of 12 and reach a verdict. Um, I have had situations where more than one alternate has been involved in jury deliberation. So your job as alternates is critical to this case and will remain critical until uh, the jury reaches a verdict. And so for that reason, you are going to be treated just like the jury of 12. You will be sequestered in the courthouse. You will not be uh, allowed access to your phones or other electronic devices. Uh, you will be provided lunch and breaks similar to the regular jury of 12. If the jury of 12 reaches a verdict without the help of any of the alternates, at the time that they're ready to announce their verdict, we will bring the six alternates into the courtroom along with the rest of us and so that you will be present when that jury verdict is announced and then as well when the jury is released after service in this case you will you will be you will be allowed to rejoin the jury of 12 uh, for that concluding um, procedure uh, so with that in mind I will now begin by selecting the six numbers So these are the six alternates. Juror 17. Juror 12. Juror 2. Juror 18. Juror 16. Juror 10. And now I will begin um, selecting the four person. Again, if you would rather not, just let us know. Juror 15. Okay. Jury number four. Jury 11. I can do that. You, you'd agree to act as four person? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So juror 11 is four person. 
I know that um, prior to you coming into the courtroom this morning, you were asked to order up your lunch. Uh, I know we place that order. It usually arrives around 1230-ish. Um, the lunch is already here? Okay. So what I'm going to ask you to do is have lunch first, um, both the alternates and the regular jury, uh, and then uh, you begin your deliberation as soon as you're done your lunch. Um, I will uh, make uh, 12 copies of my jury instructions for your use as you wish during your deliberation. You obviously have your note notepads for your use as you wish during your deliberation consistent with my jury instructions. Uh, our court reporter will ensure that you have all of the exhibits that have been fully marked as exhibits in this case immediately available to you. You will be provided with electronic equipment to play any electronic pieces of equipment. If you run into any difficulty whatsoever in playing any of the electronic um, items, simply advise the bailiff and we'll make accommodations to make that exhibit available to you. Is there anything further from counsel? No, Judge. Okay. So with um, my instructions in mind and the evidence you've heard, I'm going to ask you to begin your deliberations after you've concluded lunch. Thank you. All right. And if I could see counsel just for a second.